Hello, everyone, and welcome to Henry Schein's series on COVID-19 on YouTube. I'm Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein, and it's my pleasure to always welcome Dr. David Resnick, who will be updating us all on all things related to the recovery from the pandemic with this very special Mother's Day episode. Dr. Resnick, welcome. So good day, everyone, and welcome to the COVID-19 and Dentistry May Clinical Update. What kind of information is out there that's going to impact your practice, which is going to impact your family? And this is an important time because this week we will be celebrating Mother's Day. So this is our Mother's Day special edition. And I'm going to start off just a bit talking about mine. Uh, my mother actually was a refugee from Germany. This is a slide or pictures taken in July of 1941. She was a new immigrant to the country. She was leaving Nazi Germany, coming to America, landed in Tampa, and she won a national contest on what Americanism means. And I've always been proud of my mother. She's in heaven these days, but mothers are really an important part of our, day, of our lives. And my mom was especially important in my life, and I hope that yours are too. So happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers who are out there, and uh, best wishes for a great weekend. So where are we with our COVID-19 community levels by county? Once again, the news is good for most of the country. If you look, there are very few uh, yellow areas, yellow or a little bit of caution, and then we have some orange areas, which means there's some higher transmission going on. And you can see that's in the upper northeast and in the colder parts of our country. But so where are we? If we consider where we were in January to where we are today, it's been remarkable. People are going out to restaurants, going out to ball games. They're coming back to our dental offices, and we still need to show that we're performing the safest dental visit, and that's one of our keys here. If you look at the daily update for the United States, you can see that the cases are trending upward, and we're going to talk about that. The most important number is, though, the regretfully, we still are losing people. There were uh, 308 deaths but the trend is going down, and that is really important because we want the death trend to go down from this. Hospitalizations, they're, again, they're ticking up a little bit, but again, not to the point where we were in January. There's 11,000 people within the entire United States who are hospitalized at this point. We haven't quite reached a million deaths, and as you can see, we're over 80 million cases within the United States. At least uh, 257 or 258,000 people have received at least one dose, or 82.5%. We all know that one dose doesn't get it done, that we need to stay up to date with our vaccinations. If we look at our hospital data uh, from Omicron surge and the Delta surge at Grady, you can see we were a reflection of what was going on in the country, where in the middle part of January, the numbers were truly frightening. We had almost 300 patients within one hospital, which has a bed capacity of about 653 beds. So you can imagine what we were dealing with. But now the curve went sharply down and has stayed down. So as of the end of the month, as of the beginning of this month, we literally have maybe 11 or 10 cases in the hospital. And that number is being reflected nationwide with an exception or two. So are we done with COVID? I think that's the question that most people are actually asking this day. It seems like life is back to normal, traffic's back up to full speed, our practices, as I mentioned earlier, are, are coming back to normal. Um, however, New York City entered a higher risk level for COVID in the first part of, of May reminding us that this pandemic is not over. And I think that's something we need to look at. New York City raised its COVID alert level to medium as cases surpassed a rate of 200 per 100,000 people in the five boroughs. The two boroughs that have been hit the hardest at this point are Manhattan and Staten Island. While cases are clearly going up, 
they remain well below what we saw in January. So yes, there's some issues going on in New York City. There's some issues going on in New York State. The, most of the rest of the country were doing well. How does that impact what we're going to be doing clinically and how we think about things in the future? So let's see. Hospitalizations and deaths. A far more important metric in a public health perspective remain on the decline. So are we done with COVID? We'll see. The New York Health Commissioner says that New Yorkers should exercise greater caution than they have in the last few weeks. And those who are at higher risk for disease, severe disease from COVID for whatever reason are advised to consider avoiding crowding indoor gatherings and other high risk situations. Remember when we wear a face mask, not a respirator, we are protecting others from ourselves. When we wear a respirator, a face fitting respirator, we are protecting ourselves from others. So that is something I think the public doesn't really know. And I think we need to really push that information out when we have our patients in the chair. So it's a really important piece of information. CDC classified 40 of America's more than 3,200 counties at high risk for COVID based on community level assessment. It was, of course, was up from the previous week. More than half of the high-risk counties are in New York. So again, as we look at where this disease is, right now New York is taking the brunt of it, and this has happened before. From a raw data perspective, all COVID metrics in New York remain well below the remarkably high levels that we were seeing in January. The rolling case average is up about 12% over the rolling average for the prior four weeks, but hospitalizations and deaths are still, still both declining, and that is important. Deaths are declining by 50%, an important number. A subvariant of Omicron, BA2-12-1, caused more than 36% of new infections last week, according to CDC data. It's up nearly 27% of cases from the week prior and 17% of the infections the week before that. Though BA2, which people call the stealth Omicron, is still dominant in the uh, Omicron subvariant circulating at 62% of cases, its proportion has decreased in recent weeks, falling from about 75% of the infections. Remember one thing that we talked about before and that I really think we need to stress. When we had national outbreaks, when we were in major pandemic uh, concerns, we had a whole new type come up. So we went from alpha to beta to gamma. All of those actually remarkably impacted the United States. We know what Delta did, and the death rate went up during Delta, the hospitalizations went up during Delta, but you have their own major variants. We very seldom see a break off or a sub variant cause a national outbreak. We haven't seen that yet. And so I think that's important to know. So we still are dealing with Omicron. We've been dealing with Omicron since December. Um, and gratefully at this point, we don't see a Sigma or whatever the new theoretical model will bring. So at this point, I, again, we're just looking at the sub variants, which should not cause a biggest issue as a major variant. So experts say they don't expect a major COVID resurgence like the one American experienced earlier this year because of the Omicron subvariants. So that's, the, again, the point. If we have a new major variant, pay attention to the news, find out what's going on. But the most important thing, and I keep on stressing this, is to really know your community levels because it impacts our infection control. And let's just take a moment to think of where we have come in infection control. Uh, when I was in school, which was um, in the, not in the 70s, but a little bit later in the 80s, um, I was a wet finger dentist. We didn't wear gloves except for oral surgery and periodontal surgery. Um, Luckily, I never got herpetic whitlow or any kind of other diseases, but then HIV came along in the 1980s and in the 1990s, we started wearing gloves and masks and gowns. We, we were adjusting to a bloodborne pathogen standard. The question is, will we maintain the kinds of standards we have with an airborne transmission? 
um, that the 21st century model is not quite where we're at, but we do wear those face fitting respirators. We're always going to wear eye protection. I prefer shields, but it really truly is up to you. So are we seeing a change in how we do our business? We still are going to produce uh, aerosols. We still have flu in the community, and 40,000 people a year die from flu. We still have COVID hanging around. Is it time to go back to the 90s, or should we really be focused on the 21st century, which is uh, where I think we should stay? And we've shown this slide before, according to the CDC, uh, the PPE equipment that we need during aerosol generating procedures is a face uh, fitting respirator or an N95 that gets seal checked on an annual basis, a face shield or goggles, um, gloves of course, an isolation gown. There is an acceptable alternative for PPE using a face mask. So if you're in a green area and there are minimal cases, that could be an acceptable option according to the CDC. Uh, right now, my staff, and even though I have all of these extra oral devices, HEPA filtration, chair side evacuation, et cetera, et cetera, we're still wearing N95s for our aerosol generating procedures. And that still is the recommendation. But we really need to start thinking about infection control as where we have been, where we were based on bloodborne pathogens, and now what are we going to do about um, airborne pathogens, I guess is, is what we're going to say. Should we continue doing what we're doing? In my humble opinion, I, I and for my staff and the hospital setting I'm in, we are not changing our processes at this point. The incidence of COVID-19 amongst community dentists practicing in Canada, this was actually a study, a, a prospective cohort study over a six uh, month period of time that has showed up in the Journal of the American Dental Association. Um, oral healthcare settings, we have a potentially high risk of causing cross, cross infection between dentists and patients and among dental staff members due to close contact and of course the use of aerosol generating procedures. Remember, most of the outbreaks that we have seen in dental offices to date have been in the front desk area. So we're doing a really great job. We're carrying over our, our recommendations for PPE for bloodborne pathogens. We've made the switch to airborne pathogens. We've really done a great job. But the authors wanted to look and estimate COVID-19 incidence rates amongst Canadian dentists over a six month period of time, our neighbor up north. So what did they find? It was a prospective cohort study of 644 licensed dentists starting from July 29 through 2020 through February 12th of 21. It was an online questionnaire um, to look at assessments of COVID risk among healthcare workers, which used to collect data on self-reported severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, or COVID, every four weeks. Median age of the participants was 47. Most participants were women and general practitioners. Median follow-up time was 188 days. Six participants reported COVID-19 infections during the study period and giving an incident rate of 5.1 per 100,000 person days. The dentist proportion was estimated to be 1,084 per 100,000 dentists and 1,864 per 100,000 people. So we are really doing a good job. The incident proportion to estimated incident proportion for dental healthcare workers or dentists was lower than in their community, which means we're doing a good job of taking care of ourselves. The low infection rate observed amongst Canadian dentists from July 29, when we were in panic mode through February 12th of 21, should be reassuring to the general community and the general community. Although infection rates were low amongst Canadian dentists, it's important that we continue to collect surveillance data to see if any kind of changes happen. Of course, that's just common sense. So what about where we are in the United States? About 60% of us have already had COVID-19, a rate of infection that increased dramatically from December to February due to the highly contagious Omicron variant and the subvariants, which are even more contagious. About 34% of Americans have already been infected in the final month of 2021. The agency reports in a new study by February, that number had grown up to 58%. So we do get some um, 
uh, antibodies that are produced that will get protection by getting infected. So there is natural immunity, but one point that's important, there are newer versions of Omicron subvariants. And to be frankly honest, the, the antibodies that we produce by getting um, infected from the initial Omicron variant will not protect you from the new subvariants that are out there. I know that was a bit of a mouthful, but not all Omicrons are the same. And so the, the three and four var variations of Omicron are literally causing um, this high rate of infection. They looked at uh, the presence of coronavirus antibodies to estimate the rate of infection. The existence of antibodies varied by age from as high as 75% in children and teenagers 17 and younger to 33% of those who are 65 and older. And this is from WebMD. As of February 22, about 75% of children and adolescents, as I, I just mentioned, had serologic evidence of previous infection with SARS-CoV-2 with approximately one third becoming seropositive since December. So again, we really went through a contagious period during winter of last year and winter of this year. The greatest increase in zero prevalence during this period of time occurred in the age groups with the lowest vaccination coverage. Again, we're going to talk about that. The proportion of the U.S. fully vaccinated by April 22 increased with age. So you can look 5 to 11, 28 percent, 12 to 17, getting closer to 60 percent, 18 to 49, you're doing good. We're about 70 percent. 50 to 64, we're hitting that 80%. That's my category, go team. And greater than 65 years is 90%. So it's very important. And the reason I bring this up is um, it's really important to make sure that our families are vaccinated, especially during Mother's Day. We want our families vaccinated so we can have a wonderful time celebrating um, our mothers. Lower seroprevalence among adults aged greater than 65 who are at greater risk for severe illness from COVID might also be related to the increased use of additional precautions with increasing age, meaning wearing more face masks inside, uh, social distancing, things that we were doing at the beginning of the pandemic, and things that we should continue to do. The findings um, illustrate a high infection rate for Omicron. We have known that since the beginning, but it really has hit our kids. Seropositivity for these antibodies should not be interpreted as protection from future infection. And that was the point that I was trying to make. While COVID-19 is still capable of inflicting mass deaths and disability, there are signs that the virus and our relationship to it is shifting in subtle ways to make it more like the flu. And so, yes, it's not causing as many hospitalizations at this point. It's not causing as many deaths at this point. It still has almost caused in two years almost a million deaths within the United States, which is significantly higher than the flu, which is about 40,000 per year. Vaccination remains the safest strategy for preventing complications from COVID-19 infection, including hospitalizations amongst children and adults. So you can see how highly infectious it is by turning on the news and seeing what elected official has COVID at this point. Seropositivity following infection provides additional protection from severe disease and hospitalization. It is truly important that we stay up to date with our vaccinations, and that is key. Now, when we're talking about vaccinations in the United States, people who are 50 and older can get a fourth booster. Um, I think the fourth booster is really important for people who are very vulnerable. Um, and that can include being 65 and older, as they're doing in certain countries, having histories of diabetes. Um, we do know that people with HIV who have high CD4 counts actually respond really well, but people who are immunocompromised, immunosuppressed, people who are older, their other risk factors should probably go ahead and get their fourth dose as recommended by the CDC. Uh, so another article came out from the uh, panel and, and people under 50 should wait for the next generation of COVID-19 vaccine boosters. Most Americans should wait and uh, in, in getting, and this is over 50, and I really think it should be over 65, that's my personal opinion, should wait for a fourth dose now to prevent COVID-19 infections. 
and this was according to several members of the CDC's advisory committee. Those with a high risk of grave illness from an infection consider an extra shot. Most people should hold out for better vaccines later this year. Both Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech are having uh, their vaccine boosters only offer limited protection against newer strains such as the BA2 subvariants. So again, if you're uh, just 50, you're 55, you're not at high risk, you should be doing fine. And I would probably hold off until we have a booster that is really set up to take care of Omicron. But if you are at risk, please go ahead and get that fourth booster. It is easy to get. You can get it at pharmacies around the country. Um, I actually got my fourth booster because I live with someone who's immunocompromised. I have older members in my family and we are getting together. So I went ahead and got the fourth booster at a grocery store pharmacy. COVID deaths are no longer overwhelmingly among unvaccinated. I think that is a really important change. What's happening is our elderly are getting impacted more. Unvaccinated people account for most deaths in the U.S. and through much of the coronavirus pandemic. But that has changed, and according to the Washington Post analysis of both state and federal data, the vaccinated made up 42% of fatalities in January and February during the highly contagious Omicron variant surge compared with 23% of deaths in September, the peak of the Delta wave. So again, vaccinated were really high, but now it looks like the number is switching to older. As a group, the unvaccinated remain far more vulnerable. This is not a reason or excuse not to get vaccinated. Now, please stay up to, your, up to date. The unvaccinated remain far more vulnerable to the worst consequences of infection, far more likely to die than people who are, are vaccinated, and they are especially more at risk than people who have received a booster shot. A key explanation for the rise amongst deaths in vaccinated is COVID-19 fatalities are again concentrated amongst the elderly. Nearly two-thirds of people who died during Omicron surge were 75 and older, according to this analysis. Seniors are overwhelmingly immunized, but vaccines are less effective and their potency wades over in older people away, uh, it wanes over a period of time. So again, we're celebrating Mother's Day this weekend, and many of us have older mothers. Uh, mine is in heaven at this point, but if my mom, my mother-in-law is still alive, she is in this age group. And so therefore we did get her the fourth uh, booster because she does live in not quite assisted living, but in an elderly place where there are people who could get the infection. So again, Mother's Day is important. Don't forget your fathers, take care of them as well. Our older people in our community are really at risk. Clear compared with someone in their 20s, a person over 65 years old is not slightly more likely to die from COVID, but at least 65 times more likely to die of COVID. Over age 75, they become 140 times more likely to die. Over age 85, 340 times more likely to die from a COVID infection. All these rates are relative to the 18 to 29 year old age group, was selected as a reference group because it has accounted for the largest cumulative number of COVID-19 cases compared to other age groups. So that's four times higher, as I mentioned. I think, as I'm, as I'm saying, this is a family weekend for many of us. And so, therefore, we really need to talk not just to our family, but we, which is important, but to our patients and share this information because our older patients are very valuable uh, to our practice, to our community. The, the wisdom that they offer, the experience that they offer. And here is a chance where we can really make a difference and make sure that uh, when we have older people in the chair that we give them information, preventive information that is not just oral health care information, but information to make sure that they stay out of the hospital. This is just the reference chart of hospitalization and death by age. And as you can see, uh, on the compared to the 18 to 29 year olds, 65 to 74 death was 65 times more likely, 140 times more likely for the 75 to 84 group, 
and 330 times more likely in the 85% group. Same for hospitalizations, although those numbers aren't as extreme, but we're seeing hospitalizations 10 times more likely for someone 85 years or older, eight times more likely than someone who's 75 to 84, and five times more likely from 65 to 74. So again, this is information that we can share with our patients that will help them um, manage through this ends of this pandemic. Well, at least we hope it's getting towards the end. So what is the effectiveness of the second Pfizer, that's what BNT stands for, booster vaccine against hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19 in adults age 60 and plus? This was a study that was conducted in Israel. Remember that Israel and Pfizer, BioNTech sort of started together. They were doing population uh, inoculations uh, for a period of time. And um, so what study came out of Israel? They did approve a fourth vaccine dose, which is the second booster for individuals age 60 and older and who had received a first, first booster dose four or more months earlier. The retrospective cohort studied, including all members of a health service age 60 to 100 who were eligible for the second booster in January. Hospitalizations and mortality due to COVID-19 among participants who received the second booster dose were compared with participants who received one booster dose. A total of 563,000 participants met the eligibility criteria. 328, almost 329,000 received a second booster dose during the 40-day study period. Hospitalizations due to SARS-CoV-2 occurred in 270 of the second booster recipients and 550 participants who only received one booster dose. So again, it showed protection against hospitalizations. Deaths due to COVID-19 occurred in 92 of the second booster recipients and 232 who'd only received one dose. The study demonstrates a substantial reduction in hospitalization and deaths due to COVID-19 conferred by a second booster in Israeli adults age 60 and over. So my, my recommendation at this point was if you're 60 and older, if you're around immunocompromised patients, it meets the United States criteria, which is 50 and older. Um, if you are uh, concerned, go ahead and get that fourth booster. I was traveling, I was doing a lot of things, I got my fourth booster, I didn't have any headaches, my arm was a little sore, no weakness, none of the things that we were seeing at the beginning. So that was also good news. So let's look at the weekend review. And there's several opinions that we get to look at over a period of time. Some are reasonable, some are not reasonable. And so I'm looking at Dr. Gandhi, who is from UCSF and in Infectious Diseases. Um, she's been moderating these uh, conversations. And so the first issue that she wanted to bring up were masks. Mask mandates didn't seem to work because people use a variety of masks and cloth masks don't seem to reduce transmission. Remember, just wearing a face mask protects others from you, not you from others. That way you need to have something like an N95, KN95, et cetera. Good masks certainly work for individuals to limit exposure to a respiratory pathogen, as I just stated. Some people double mask. So medical scientific literature turning to effectiveness of one-way masking with good masks for anyone who wants to mask moving forward. So good masks are the N95s, the KN95s, the FFP2, et cetera. And so we really want to understand that if you're wearing a, a um, KN95 mask, that really what you're doing at this point is you are protecting yourself and protecting others. So you get the double benefit there. Issue number two, vaccine effectiveness in those who are immunocompromised. The mRNA vaccines work so well that there is a lot of data emerging that a strong immune response is generated even in those on chemotherapy, immunomodulator agents for rheumatologic conditions, people with HIV, and a host of other immunocompromising conditions. And it says these are powerful vaccines. This leads to booster discussion and who needs the fourth booster and when the European equivalent of the CDC has decided on those who are immunocompromised are those who are 80 years and older. 
The U.S. guidelines are more permissive down to age 50. In Israel, they're doing 60. So there is really no consensus at this point. Um, I'm doing what I can to remain protected because I have had so much joy going to conferences like Thrive Live 22 or the Midwest Dental Conference and running into colleagues and people that I haven't seen in person in two years. It brings a level of, of joy uh, just to be around your colleagues and, and just to be around family and friends and, and not being as concerned that walking outside is going to end you up in the hospital. The issue of COVID zero is another big issue. What's happening in China, specifically Shanghai, reveals that we cannot eliminate COVID due to four reasons. Number one, 29 species of animals carry the virus and we can't kill all the animals, that'd be terrible. It has a long incubation period. Symptoms look like other pathogens. We're just in, in certain parts of the country, we're entering in the spring um, season with blooms. Um, in Atlanta, we've had a, a gorgeous weather and we've had a lot of blooms and a lot of allergies to go with it. There, are the flu vaccine this last year was only 18% protective. Though we haven't seen a whole lot of flus, why? Because we're masking more. Vaccines increasingly are non-sterilizing. They're protective, but they're non-sterilizing. In other words, they don't kill the virus. We can reduce severe disease to very low rates by vaccination, monoclonal antibodies like Evushield for immunocompromised or oral antiviral treatments such as Paxlovid, malnupiravir, all of which need global access. And we actually need to get some of that here. It's harder to find in the United States right now. So I just wanted to end our presentation today by saying a happy Mother's Day to all. Um, a happy Father's Day coming up in June. It's been a pleasure to continue these updates. We look forward to any questions or concerns that you might have. The bottom line is we're in the green. Uh, most of the country is doing well. If you're in the New York area, please take a little bit more precautions, but we're into a new period. And I think the discussion that I, I think we need to have uh, with the CDC, with organized dentistry, with NIOSH, is where we should be for the time moving forward. Um, I'm in the more conservative uh, field here. I'm thinking that I need to protect my staff and my patients, and this isn't over yet. And so until somebody says, oh, COVID is gone, or we can clear it like we can with some diseases like Hep C, et cetera, at this point, uh, we're going to maintain wearing our face-fitting respirators, our shields, our gowns, gloves, et cetera. So as always, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to turn it back to the wonderful Dr. Severance. And again, have a great holiday time. Thank you, Dr. Resnick, for the continual updates, and thank you for watching. Please email us any questions, concerns, or requests for future topics at webinars at henryshine.com. And please subscribe to our YouTube page by clicking the subscribe button below. And to be notified of any premieres, click the bell icon. Thanks so once again for your attention. Have a happy Mother's Day with your loved ones, and please stay safe and stay informed.